the most ordinary sights and sounds and smells, the texture of shadows on the floor in front of you, all these things without being named and saying that's a shadow, that's red, that's brown, that's somebody's foot. When you don't name things any longer, you start seeing them. Because say when a person says, I see a leaf, immediately one thinks of a spearhead shaped thing outlined in black and filled in with flat green. No leaf looks like that. No leaves. Leaves are not green. That's why Lao Tzu said, the five colors make a man blind, the five tones make a man deaf. Because if you can only see five colors, you're blind. And if you can only hear five tones in music, you're deaf. You see, if you, if you force sound into five tones, you force color into five colors, you're blind and deaf. The, the world of color is infinite, as is the world of sound. And it is only through stopping, fixing conceptions on the world of color and sound that you really begin to hear it and see it. So this, uh, shall I be so bold as to use the word discipline of meditation or zazen, lies behind the extraordinary capacity of Zen people to develop such great arts as uh, the gardens, the tea ceremony, the calligraphy, and the grand painting of the Sung dynasty and of the Japanese uh, Sumi tradition. And it was because, uh, especially in tea ceremony, which means literally channel you in Japanese means hot water of tea. They found in the very simplest things of everyday life, magic. In the words of the poet Hokoji, marvelous power and supernatural activity, drawing water, carrying wood. And you know, it is sometimes when you say a word and make the word meaningless, you take the word yes, 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 yes. It becomes funny. That's why they use mu, you know, in Zen training, which means no. Mu. And you, you, when you get this going for a long time, the word ceases to mean anything. And it becomes magical. That sound. Now, what you have to realize in the further continuance of Zazen, that as you... Uh, well, let me say first in a preliminary way, the easiest way to stop thinking is first of all to think about something that doesn't have any meaning. That's my point in talking about moo or yes, or counting your breath, or listening to a sound that has no meaning. Because that stops you thinking, because you become fascinated in the sound. Then as you get on and you just, the sound only, uh, comes a point when the sound is taken away and you're wide open. Now, at that point, uh, there will be a kind of preliminary, so-called satori, and you will think, wowee, that's it. You'll be so happy, you'll be walking on air. When Suzuki Daisets was asked, what is it like to have satori, he said, well, it's like ordinary everyday experience, except about two inches off the ground. But there's another saying, that that student who has attained Satori goes to hell as straight as an arrow. No Satori around here. Because anybody who has a spiritual experience, whether you get it through Zazen or through uh, LSD or anything, you know, that gives you that experience, if you hold on to it, say, now I've got it, it's gone out of the window. Because the minute you grab a living thing, it's like catching a handful of water. The harder you clutch, the faster it squirts through your fingers. There's nothing to get hold of. Because you don't need to get hold of anything. 
You had it from the beginning. Of course, you can see that by various methods of meditation. But the trouble is the people who come out of that and brag about it. Say, I've seen it. Equally intolerable are the people who study Zen and come out and brag to their friends about how much their legs hurt and how long they sat and what an awful thing it was. They're sickening. Because the, the discipline side of this thing is not meant to be something um, awful. It's not done in a masochistic spirit or a sadistic spirit. Suffering builds character. Therefore, suffering is good for you. When I went to school in England, uh, the basic premise of education was that suffering builds character. And therefore, um, all senior boys were at liberty to bang about the junior ones with a perfectly clear conscience because they were doing them a favor. It was good for them. It was building their character. And as a result of this kind of attitude, the word discipline has begun to stink. It's been stinking for a long time. But we need a kind of entirely new attitude towards this because without that quiet and that non-striving life becomes messy when you let go finally because there's nothing to hold on to you have to be awfully careful not to turn into loose yogurt uh, let me give two opposite illustrations when you ask most people to lie flat on the floor and relax you find that they are full of tensions because they don't really believe that the floor will hold them up and therefore they are holding themselves together they're uptight they're afraid that if they don't do this even though the floor is supporting them they'll suddenly turn into a gelatinous mass and trickle away in all directions <laughs> Then there are other people, when you tell them to relax, they go like a limp rag. <laughs> but you see, the, the human organism is a subtle combination of hardness and softness, of flesh and bones. And the side of Zen, which has to do with neither doing nor not doing, but knowing that you are it anyway and you don't have to seek it, that's Zen flesh. But the side in which you can come back into the world with this attitude of not seeking and knowing you're it and not fall apart, that requires bones. And one of the most difficult things, this is, belongs to, of course, a generation we all know about that was running around some time ago, where they caught on to Zen and they started anything goes painting. They started anything goes sculpture. They started anything goes way of life. Now I think we're recovering from that today. At any rate, our painters are beginning once again to return to glory, to marvelous articulateness and vivid color. Nothing like it has been seen since the stained glass of Chartres. That's a good sign. But it requires that um, there be in our daily use of freedom. And I'm not just talking about political freedom. I'm talking about the freedom which comes when you know that you're it forever and ever and ever. And it'll be so nice when you die because uh, that'll be a change. But it'll come back some other way. <laughs> And when you know that and you've seen through the whole mirage, then watch out because there may still be in you some seeds of hostility, some seeds of pride, some seeds of um, wanting to put down other people or wanting just to defy 
uh, the normal arrangements of life. So that is why in the order of a Zen monastery various duties are assigned. The novices have the light duties and the more senior you get the heavy duties. For example the Roshi very often is the one who cleans out the benjo, the toilet. And everything is kept in order. There is a kind of beautiful, almost princely asceticism. Because by reason of that order being kept all the time, the vast free energy which is contained in the system doesn't run amok. The understanding of Zen, the understanding of awakening, the understanding of well, we'll call it mystical experience, is one of the most dangerous things in the world. And uh, for a person who cannot contain it, it's like putting a million volts through your electric shaver. You blow your mind and it stays blown. <laughs> now, if you go off in that way, that is what would be called in Buddhism a Pracheka Buddha private Buddha. He's one who goes off into the transcendental world and is never seen again. And he's made a mistake from the standpoint of Buddhism because from the standpoint of Buddhism there is no fundamental difference between the transcendental world and this everyday world. The Bodhisattva, you see, who doesn't go off into a nirvana and stay there forever and ever, but comes back and lives ordinary everyday life to help other beings to see through it too. He, he doesn't come back because he feels he has some sort of solemn duty to help mankind and all that kind of pious cant. He comes back because he sees the two worlds are the same. He sees all other beings as Buddhas. He sees them to use the phrase of G.K. Chesterton's, but now a great thing in the street seems any human nod, where move in strange democracy the million masks of God. And it's fast, fantastic to look at people and see that they really, uh, deep down, are, are, are enlightened. They're it. They're, they're faces of the divine. And they look at you and say, oh no, but I'm not divine, I'm just ordinary little me. And you look at them in a funny way, and here you see uh, the Buddha nature looking out of their eyes straight at you and saying it's not. And saying it quite sincerely. And that's why when you get up against a great guru, be he Zen master or whatever, he has a funny look in his eyes. When you say, I have a problem, guru, I really, I'm mixed up and I don't understand, he looks at you in this queer way. And you think, oh dear me, he's reading my most secret thoughts. <laughs> he's seeing all the awful things I am, all my cowardice, all my shortcomings. He's not doing anything of the kind. He isn't even interested in such things. He's looking at, if I may use Hindu terminology, he's looking at Shiva in you. Saying, my God, Shiva, won't you come off it? <laughs> <laughs> So then you see the Bodhisattva who is, uh, if I, I'm assuming, quite a knowledge of Buddhism in this assembly, but the Bodhisattva as distinct from the Pratyeka Buddha, Bodhisattva doesn't go off into nirvana. He doesn't go off into permanent um, withdrawn ecstasy. He doesn't go into a kind of catatonic samadhi. That's all right. There are people who can do that. That's their vocation. That's their specialty. Just as a long thing is the long body of Buddha and a short thing is the short body of Buddha. But if you really understand that Zen, that Buddhist idea of enlightenment, is not comprehended in the idea of the transcendental, neither is it comprehended in the idea of the ordinary. Not in terms of the infinite, not in terms of the finite. Not in terms of the eternal, not in terms of the temporal, because they're all concepts.
So, let me say again, I'm not talking about the ordering of ordinary everyday life in a reasonable and methodical way as being school teacherish and saying nice if you were nice people that's what you would do for heaven's sake don't be nice people but the thing is that unless you do have that basic framework of a certain kind of order and a certain kind of discipline the force of liberation will blow the world to pieces it's too strong a current for the wire so then it's terribly important to see beyond ecstasy ecstasy yeah is the soft and lovely flesh huggable and kissable and that's very good but beyond ecstasy are bones, what we call hard facts, hard facts of everyday life. Incidentally, we shouldn't forget to mention the soft facts, there are many of them. But in the hard fact, if you say, what we mean, the world as seen in an ordinary everyday state of consciousness. To find out that that is really no different from the world of supreme ecstasy. Well. It's rather like this. Let's suppose, as so often happens, you think of ecstasy as insight, as seeing light. There's a Zen poem which says, a sudden crash of thunder, the mind doors burst open. And there sits the ordinary old man. See, there's a sudden vision. Satori, breaking, wowee! And the doors of the mind are blown apart. And there sits the ordinary old man. That's just little, little you, you know. Lightning flashes, sparks shower. In one blink of your eyes you've missed seeing. Why? Because here is the light. The light, the light, the light. Every mystic in the world has seen the light. That brilliant, blazing energy, brighter than a thousand suns, which is locked up in everything. Now imagine this. Imagine you're seeing it. Like uh, you see aureoles round Buddhas. Like you see the beatific vision at the end of Dante's Paradiso. Vivid, vivid light so bright that it's like the clear light of the void in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It's beyond light. It's so bright. And you watch it receding from you. And on the edges, like a great star, there becomes a rim of red. And beyond that, a rim of orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And you see this great mandala appearing, this great sun. And beyond the violet, there's black, black like obsidian, not flat black, but transparent black, like lacquer. And again, blazing out of the black as the yang comes from the yin, more light. Going, going, going. And along with this light, there comes sound. There's a sound so tremendous with the white light that you can't hear it so piercing that it seems to annihilate the ears but then along with the colors the sound goes down the scale in harmonic intervals down 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 until it gets to a deep thundering bass which is so vibrant that in turn it turns into something solid and you begin to get a similar spectrum of textures now all this time you've been watching a kind of a thing radiating out but it says you know this isn't all i can do and the rays start going dancing like this and naturally the sound starts going waving too as it comes out and then the textures start uh, varying themselves and they say well you've been looking at this thing as I've been describing it so far in a flat dimension 
Uh, let's add a third dimension. It's going to come right at you now. See, this way. And meanwhile, it says it's not just that we're going to go you 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 like this. We're going to do little curly cues. We're going to go kajoo 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 like this. And it says, well, that's uh, just the beginning. We can go tum 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 tum, making squares and turns. And then suddenly, you see in all the little details that become so intense that all kinds of little sub figures are contained within what you thought were originally the main figures. And the sound starts going all different, amazing complexities of sound all over the place and this thing's going 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 and you think you're going to go out of your mind and suddenly it turns into why us sitting around here